Welcome back, everyone. I am Wesley Schantz, trying to get started here. And this is Signum Academy, our first Monday of February. And we're looking again at Rosemary Sutcliffe. I think I've got to find the book uh, so I can read some passages from it here. Um, it's The Sword and the Circle, the first of the King Arthur books. Right, here's my slide for that. Now, if you're watching live on Twitch and you've read the book, that's awesome, that's great. Uh, if you're here and you haven't read it yet, that's totally fine. Won't be too many spoilers for you. And if you're watching this later, uh, then you can always send in questions by email. Um, but if you're here live, you can type them right into the Twitch chat, and I'll try to check that from time to time. Um, questions about the book, about Rosemary Sutcliffe, about Signum Academy. If you have other questions, I don't know if I'll be as helpful, but uh, you can type them in too. Um, Use your discretion. And uh, I'll pause every so often to, um, to try to respond. If you just have things you're noticing about the book, um, or things you're observing that you want to share, um, go ahead and put those in there too. Uh, and as we're getting started here, you see I've got a couple different uh, covers. The first one is actually the version I've been reading, um, and uh, reading it online, of course, um, since I don't have access to my library right now. Um, and you can find this book on archive.org. Uh, there's a number of versions of it there, and uh, that's how I've been enjoying this book the last few days. I've been reading it furiously. Turns out this book is a bit longer than the Beowulf book. Um, so I read it, uh, but quickly. Um, so it's all relatively fresh in my mind for, for today, um, but I'll have to definitely reread it before our next meeting uh, and take my time over it a bit more. Um, you can see the one on the right here is a different author, and I thought I would just mention right up front that there are many versions of the King Arthur stories. We're focusing on Rosemary Sutcliffe's work, and um, the ways that she carries on a lot of the kinds of um, interests and themes, uh, concerns, things that our main authors, uh, the Inklings, Tolkien, Lewis, um, and the likes, uh, things they're interested in. But if what you're mainly interested in is King Arthur stories, well, then there's many versions out there for you to read. Um, so, again, I am open to a variety of responses here, but if there's people in the audience who know a lot about King Arthur, um, you've probably read some other versions already, um, if there's people out there who this is your first brush with King Arthur, from Rosemary Sutcliffe's retelling, then, and, and you want to read more, then there's, there's stuff out there for you too. Um, so we are starting with her. If her work is too difficult, <laughs> if this book seems intimidating to you, that's totally okay. Um, like I said, it caught me by surprise a little bit how tough some of this reading was. Um, but it's very much in that young adult, you know, teenage kind of age range. Um, if you're not quite to that just yet, then maybe check out this version by Roger Lancelin Green, uh, King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Um, this is the version I used to teach in uh, seventh grade. So teaching seventh graders. This was just about right, and, and there is a lot of vocabulary in there. 
it's still a pretty thick book, um, but it's not as challenging, not as heavy going as Rosemary Sutcliffe's first. Um, so you might check that one out. Lancel and Green, I think, is actually sort of associated with the Inklings. He might have been a student of Tolkien and Lewis or, or something along those lines. Uh, anyway, he's in that same time period, roughly. Again, Rosemary Sutcliffe a little later. Um, talking, uh, I think her book, The Sword in the Circle, comes out in 1981. Uh, so, solid 40 years ago. Um, but this version, King Arthur, is even 30 years before that. So, 1950s that this one comes out. Of course, Tolkien and Lewis knew a little bit about King Arthur um, and have their own versions. Um, so just to throw these out there for you, The Fall of Arthur, it's one of those books that J.R.R. Tolkien's son, Christopher Tolkien, edits and gets published after Tolkien's death. Um, Fall of Arthur, something that Tolkien was working on but never, never finished to his satisfaction. Um, and it's pretty short. Uh, there's a lot of interesting takes on the King Arthur story, but this one in particular, it goes fairly dark, fairly, uh, well, it's called the fall of Arthur, right? His, his death um, is the main thing that Tolkien's focused on, and it's, it's just really that portion of the story. Um, C.S. Lewis is part of his so-called... Um, sci-fi trilogy you know the um uh the third book in that trilogy which is really different from the other ones i think um not really maybe the most faithful king arthur story but definitely has some king arthur stuff going on um it's called that hideous strength if you're into sort of weird sci-fi you like C.S. Lewis's habit of sort of mixing and throwing together bunches of different things uh, might be worth looking at. Um, it does have sort of more adult material in it too, though, so just be warned. Um, dealing with a, a marriage that's not going well and a uh, whole kind of social problem uh, that Lewis is making almost like a almost making fun of i don't know how seriously to take this book um it's strange but uh it's got merlin in it so the third one here and this is the one i'd recommend personally i really like the once and future king by th white um so again not exactly an inkling but in that same kind of time period same kind of world that this book comes out of and again, I, I can't speak for T.H. White as a person. I've heard he was kind of a strange guy. Uh, but his writing and his approach to this story is really excellent. And the first part of The Once and Future King is The Sword in the Stone. That's what you got on the cover. And it tells kind of King Arthur as a kid. It's very much T.H. White sort of making up a lot of stuff but also bringing in cool historical and mythological legendary material. It's a really unique version of the story. Um, and the Merlin that T.H. White comes up with is very interesting, funny. Um, it always sticks in my mind. The thing about his Merlin is that he's a, a time traveler from the future. Uh, so there is that kind of sci-fi element in there, but it's really just used for comedic effect, mostly, in that first book. These books, kind of like we talked about with J.K. Rowling and uh, Harry Potter books, these books in The Once and Future King really sort of grow up with the reader. So if you start with The Sword in the Stone, you like it, you can keep going with it, but just, again, they, they get a little bit more mature, um, the kinds of things he's talking about. All right, so that's just a sampling 
of the King Arthur books that leap to mind, for me at least, when I pick up The Sword in the Circle by Rosemary Sutcliffe. Um, so if you have other ones in mind that you really like, there's some modern retellings that are quite good, I'm told. Um, but I'll confess, I haven't read a whole lot of uh, King Arthur stuff. Um, just just some of these classics, I guess. Um, trying to find my way to the chat just to check. So yeah, if you have questions, comments, please put them in. Um, now here's, again, the version I've been reading, Sword and the Circle on uh, Internet Archive. I'm going to pull that up so I can read you guys a little bit from the author's note in there. I think the one I had been reading, uh, yeah, I think it was this one. So Internet Archive is basically just an online library where you can borrow books for limited time, but you can just renew them if you want to keep reading. So it's really, really cool, um, very convenient. Um, so this came from the Boston Public Library. At some point, they digitized it uh, for anyone around the world to read. Um, and so it starts with uh, the author's note. But I'll just mention here that the contents give us kind of a hint about what we're getting into. So it's worth looking at here. Um, unlike the Beowulf uh, retelling, this one has no illustrations in the book. For one thing, um, there's no illustrator, so it's it's a lot of reading. <laughs> uh, and what we're reading about is really sort of in two or three parts, depending on how you sort of count. We've got the first part that focuses on Arthur, and then the second part of the book really focuses on his round table, his knights, their different adventures. Um, and although it isn't really mentioned here, the very first part of this book also kind of focuses on Merlin. Now, he's a really interesting character, uh, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about that today. Um, especially this first chapter, we, saw, we, we see sort of a, a backstory for Merlin himself. Uh, and then it's Adventures of Arthur and Merlin, and then Adventures of the Various Knights of the Round Table. Um, so that's sort of the rough overview of this book. Um, again, it's this, the first book in a three-book series. So we're going to be looking at this one this whole month, and then the second book for next month, the third book for the following. Uh, that's the plan. Yeah. Uh, so in the author's note, try and make this a little bigger so I can read it. I hope you can read it too. Um, Rosemary Sutcliffe points out that there is this kind of connection to history. So she's best known as a historical fiction author. A lot of what she does is these retellings of myths and legends, like Beowulf. But she's got apparently a couple other books, The Lantern Bearers and Sword at Sunset. Two of her other books are more of a historical, realistic, let's say, retelling of the legends behind King Arthur. She says, um, it is to sometime early in these dark ages that King Arthur belongs. Many people, as I do, believe that behind the legends of King Arthur, as we know them today, there stands a real man. No king in shining armor, no round table, no fairy tale palace at Camelot, but a Roman British war leader who, when the dark tide of the barbarians came flooding in, did all that a great leader could do to hold them back and save something of civilization. I love that civilization is spelled with an S, because this is that British English. Um, in the Lantern Bearers and Sword at Sunset, I have written about this war leader trying to get back through the hero tale and the high romance to the real man and the world he lived in. So, just another couple of recommendations for you, like King Arthur stories. Those two books probably take a slightly different, more factual, if we can call it that, you know, based on historical fact, at least, uh, take on the King Arthur story. So if anyone out there has read those, if you're fans of Rosemary Sutcliffe, let me know what you thought of them. Um, I have not read them. Um, but so 
she's still drawn to the folklore side of things, the mass of Celtic myth and folklore and medieval splendors we know now as the legends of King Arthur. Um, there is value to the true stuff, the historical stuff, but she said there's also a really important aspect of that, that what she calls high romance, meaning legends, um, the stuff that stirs you as a reader, as a uh, as an imagination um, kind of springboard for you, right? Um, that splendor, that beauty that comes with a made-up story, essentially a fairy tale, a folk. Um, and so she recommends for that, most splendidly of all, Sir Thomas Mallory in Mort d'Arthur. So Le Mort d'Arthur, The Death of Arthur. Um, that's what I wanted to show you next. Here. So in uh, these pictures here, we've got a few of our sort of more ancient um, retellings of King Arthur. So up here, a uh, manuscript page, a handwritten page from Le Mort d'Arthur, The Death of Arthur, which comes out you know, just before we're getting printed books, um, sort of for, late 1400s. Uh, and it is got this sort of French title, but it just means The Death of Arthur. It's by an English knight, Sir Thomas Mallory. Um, this is a huge book. Uh, so if you want a challenge, really into King Arthur stories, uh, you can... You can take a crack at Le Mort d'Arthur, sort of the big, all-inclusive, you know, warts and all version of the story of King Arthur. It's got everything, um, except the bits that are in other places, right? Um, there's a long French tradition that Mallory is drawing on and just bringing into English. Um, it doesn't bring everything. There's so some German versions of stories uh, and other places, um, but he also adds a bit of his own flair, his own style to it. Um, so you're going to get sort of the authentic King Arthur if you look at Le Mort d'Arthur. Uh, as she says, it's very splendid. For my money, I'd rather read a modern retelling. <laughs> I'm okay with not quite that much jousting and um, uh, adventuring. and It's, it's a lot. Uh, a lot of names to keep track of. A lot of places, a lot of people. Um, but it is the, the real deal. Uh, then there's this statue here, this is not Sir Thomas Mallory, this is um, Gre Gregory of Monmouth? Could be mixing up the name. Um, I think it's Gregory. Let's see. What does she say? Um, so in her version, oh, of course, it's Geoffrey. Geoffrey of Monmouth. Um, her version mostly follows Mallory. Um, she's also got the Story of Vortigern and Merlin, Uther and Igraine, and Dragon Light in the Sky. That part comes from Geoffrey of Monmouth. So that's my picture here of the statue of this early English historian um, who tells a version of the King Arthur story. Uh, and so she brings that in. And then we have some other pieces from other places. Um, the Gawain and the Green Knight. Tolkien also does a, a translation of um, the Tristan and Isolt, uh, a story of love, um, and it's got a kind of Irish uh, source to it that she's bringing in. Um, Geraint and Enid, Geraint and Enid from the Welsh book, the Mabinoian. And Sir Gawain and the Loathly Lady. 
Um, there's a version of that in the Canterbury Tales, which is the version told by the wife of Bat. Um, but she says it's based on a Middle English ballad, it's not specifically talking about Chaucer's wife of Bath in her version there. And then um, the Conte de Graal, uh, so the story of the Grail, um, again, um, source material beyond Mallory. Um, but uh, she points out Beaumain's The Kitchen Knight uh, comes from Mallory himself. She thinks. Um, seems like he made that up. Um, so this is her giving us kind of a, a look behind the curtain at where these stories are coming from, where she thinks they are told best, and where she thinks they are told in more detail even. Um, so all of that is stuff you can find if you are really into the King Arthur material. You want more. Um, Let's look at her version of the story with the time we've got left here. Uh, another 10, 15 minutes today. Uh, so not, not going into a great, great detail. But like we do, you know, giving kind of a background and an overview to the story so that you can get the most out of your reading uh, as you're reading this book for yourself. And then when we meet again in a couple weeks, we will go into some more detail about a specific stories in this book. Um, so just when Rosemary Sutcliffe starts, she goes to the Merlin stories first. And this is something that I noticed when I was looking for pictures. There are not really pictures in this book, so I had to be a little creative to give you guys something to look at other than just words and my face. Um, I found, looking for Merlin pictures, that Merlin is actually put into the title of translations of this book. So instead of translating the sword and the circle word for word, the translators of this book tend to include Merlin in the title. So this is the German version, Merlin und Artus, the Spanish version, Merlin y Arturo, Okay. Um, Merlin gets sort of even before Arthur himself he's sort of the main character in the title of this book I found that really interesting um, I think that's quite perceptive on the part of these translators whoever's responsible for these um, and of course uh, Merlin is sort of a mysterious figure that's, that's part of what makes him interesting and exciting and cool um, He's clearly more than human. Uh, and just like Rosemary Sutcliffe talks about there being a historical kernel of truth, maybe, to the Arthur character, um, maybe there's some savvy counselor, uh, some wise old magician in the sense of doing magic tricks, right? Um, someone like that maybe existed. But I'm going to say Merlin probably comes from the other end of the spectrum, more in the folklore, fairy tale side of things. So this is kind of where those two things meet, where this character from folklore comes into the story to make that historical figure more than just uh, a warlord in a dark time in British history, to make him this kind of shining example of what a leader can be. Um, that's not to say that Arthur is perfect. Again, we, we see that really early on in the story. Um, but that he represents an, an inspiring vision of what a civilization could look like. Um, it's, it's imaginary. It's something we have to imagine because uh, we can't quite get there in real life. Um, and uh, that's, I think, uh, part, of the, part of the magic that, that Merlin 
cast, that spell that he casts, is to make it feel like it's worth trying. It's worth trying to create this, um, create this vision, even though it's always a little bit beyond us. Uh, so, in the uh, in the start of the story, and again, those first chapters that Rosemary Sutcliffe has here, um, we have the coming of Arthur, the sword in the stone, the sword in the lake, the round table, and the ship, the mantle, and the hawthorn tree. That's that's where Merlin leaves the story. But so we have five chapters of him guiding Arthur. First guiding Arthur's parents, but then guiding Arthur to create this kingdom of Logris, uh, this place at Camelot, which no one really knows where it is, um, that shines in the dark as an example of peace, of beauty uh, of the kind of uh, merry old England that only exists in folklore. Um, so you notice that there's a lot of swords getting thrown around here. Um, like uh, I think it's Monty Python talked about chucking swords. Um, there's the famous sword in the stone. We see that, you know, the covers of a lot of the books. But there's also, also this other sword, um, the sword from the lake. So, as you're reading, pay attention to Merlin. I don't think that'll be too hard. Um, but also, other sort of magical figures that are at the margins of the story, that's on the, on the edges, the boundaries of this world. Um, the main one being the Lady of the Lake. So the Lady of the Lake, she gets a name in this version, um, Mallory's version too, uh, Nimui, or Nimu. Um, she is a figure of some power um, greater than Merlin's own, it seems. So he seems to know that his fate is to leave the story at a certain point, and it's because of the Lady of the Lake, the Lady Nimue, that Merlin is put to a, into a magic sleep um, under that hawthorn tree. The Lady is still sort of around, though, and she does come into the rescue a few times, um, so sort of playing the same role as Merlin. But where Merlin gives Arthur his first sword, he orchestrates the whole thing with the sword and the stone. Right? Um, Arthur being able to pull that sword out represents that he is the rightful king. And sure enough, the way that these things are measured, um, he was born, he was descended from the rightful king before him. So uh, his identity was secret, but he is that guy. He is that prince and now the king. Um, that sword serves him well in his early battles, through establishing his kingdom by defeating various other warlords, causing problems in different parts of the island. But that sword eventually breaks. He needs a fresh, fresh sword. And this time, it's not Merlin who gives it to him. Although Merlin leads him to the lake, it's the Lady of the Lake who gives him Excalibur. So this is something that's really confusing, for me at least, um, because that sword in the stone is so iconic, and Excalibur is so famous and great. They're actually not the same sword. That's, that's weird. That's confusing. Um, it's almost like Excalibur is the upgraded version of the sword in the stone. Um, this is off topic, I know, but I have to share one version of this that I really enjoy is in a game called Final Fantasy II in um, the US. It's called Final Fantasy II. Um, 
but it's actually Final Fantasy IV based on its when it was actually released. Um, so you'll see it called Final Fantasy IV also. Anyway, in this game, you eventually get a special sword. Uh, I think it's called the Legend Sword, the Sword of Legend. And then you get some better swords later. Like, this is how RPGs work, right? But towards the end of the game, you can upgrade that sort of legend. You're not allowed to get rid of it because late in the game you can upgrade it. And if you do, then it becomes Excalibur. It becomes the, the sword, um, the holy sword, uh, the, this, this powerful weapon. Um, so that idea of sort of like upgrading the original sword into the, the ultimate one, um, that's what I see going on here with Excalibur. But you'll notice, Merlin asks Arthur if he thinks the sword is better, or the scabbard, the, the sheath that the sword goes in, so he can hold it. And of course, Arthur thinks the sword is magnificent, it's powerful. But Merlin points out that, in fact, it's the scabbard that is greater than the sword itself. So as great as Excalibur is, as long as Arthur is holding the sheath of the sword, uh, on his belt, he will not lose any blood. He will not lose any HP, any hit points. Uh, he'll be essentially invincible, um, which I think is pretty wild. Uh, that's a part of the story that doesn't make it into the Final Fantasy. That would make the game no fun, actually, if you had an item like that, right? And so sure enough, um, Arthur and his scabbard, his magical invincibility token, are, are parted. Um, pretty quickly, before too long. Uh, and so, uh, again, he's not perfect, right? Just, just one of many examples uh, of that being the case. All right, so Merlin, Lady in the Lake. Now, along with the swords, the sword, presumably we're talking Excalibur in the title, although maybe it doesn't really matter. <sighs> kind of less important um, what Arthur really does with the sword, maybe more important is the circle. Right, so when we talk about the circle, what do we mean? Uh, the, the round table, right? The gathering of knights, again, in peace, in harmony among one another, mostly, um, except for when they're jousting and being rude to each other and, and all that good stuff. But again, this kind of ideal vision of a way to have everybody around the same table, nobody at a higher place than anyone else, this feeling of equality, right? It's an early version of that idea. Not everyone is equal in King Arthur's world. It's not perfect. But all of the knights, all of the fighting men, these warriors, um, they have a kind of equality amongst themselves in that they sit in this circle. Um, of course, there's special spots at the table for special knights. Um, there's definitely a hierarchy among them uh, of who's best at fighting, uh, maybe uh, who's better at other things, who's best at singing, for example, whatever it might be. But, but that idea of, of the round table, that circle, um, uh, of peace, of harmony, of brotherhood, right? It's it's getting there. It's moving towards what we would recognize now as more of an equal uh, and more of a just uh, a world. So that's the pictures I've got here of of that side of the story. Um, these both come from French books. Uh, I think this one is just based on a picture in a book, and this one is another handwriting manuscript thing going on. You can see up here, they're going to parlay to the roi Arthur. So they're going to talk about King Arthur and his company, his, his knights. Um, you notice that along with the knights, pretty central here, the knights and their horses, really cool. Um, pretty important are the women. Uh, 
Um, so the ladies, the queen, she's got her crown on, this must be Guinevere, I guess. Um, and her, her ladies in waiting, her various, uh, her circle, right? So we've got, we've got the circle of knights, and then we've got this kind of other side of what's going on um, among the women. And they don't get talked about as much uh, in Rosemary Sutcliffe's retelling, I think, as in some other versions of the story you might, you might be able to find. Um, they're not really the focus in The Sword in the Circle, at least, but maybe they'll get more important in later books. Um, but they do play a significant role in a lot of the setup to the story. So as you're reading, by all means, pay attention to the swords, the round table, but also pay attention to Guinevere, to Morgan Le Fay. I've got these two pictures here. This one on the left, Morgan Le Fay, King Arthur's magician, half-sister. It's always causing problems. And then here is a uh, Guinevere picture. Um, his, his wife, his queen, uh, who also gets into some trouble. Um, both of these, uh, by the way, come from artists who are trying to make their art look more ancient, more medieval. Um, but actually, these aren't from that long ago. Uh, these are, I think, both British artists. Um, but they both emphasize not just the beauty of these women, but also their splendid sort of world, their um, magical spell-casting world for Morgan Le Fay, and this, this world of, um, of the, basically the peace, the rest, the quiet, um, all of the things that the fighting is ultimately for, for making possible, right? Um, and yet Guinevere looks so sad. She's so confined and restricted in this peaceful world with singing and books and food and snacks and the bed, right, where she can rest and take a load off. She's not happy. Um, she's terribly, terribly sad, is, is how I'm reading this picture of her. Um, and I think it's because those, those are so separated, right? We don't get to see Guinevere really in action, you know, uh, in the way we see even Arthur. And he's not even the best of the knights. Um, Morgan Le Fay, at least, is a very active character. She's always trying to cause a mayhem and um, stir things up so that her half-brother, King Arthur, has something to do, right? Some adventures to go on. Um, in Rosemary Sutcliffe's version, she's also got kind of um, more than human, uh, you know, this this power of magic and enchantment that she uses is, is something a little bit um, questionable, where exactly that comes from. Um, so maybe she's not fully in control. That's that's her excuse, anyway. Uh, that's what she says herself. And it's unclear whether she's lying to save her skin or whether she really is kind of being used by some other power beyond. Uh, so maybe that's what the uh, the leopard skin here represents, right? That natural power, maybe supernatural. Uh, Okay, so keep an eye on the women uh, as you're reading along uh, what they're up to in the story. Oh, nice. Lexical stress points out, on the topic of Excalibur, the archbishop denies young Arthur the crown, making him put the sword back so the highborn knights could have a shot at pulling it out. This could be an early bureaucratic trope along the lines of you can't fight City Hall or the Wall Street bets for editors going up against high rolling hedge Yeah, have you all been following this news about, uh, so speaking of video games, right, so not Final Fantasy, but the store GameStop 
um, Game Spot. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, their stock has been going up, up, up because people are fighting Wall Street. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like they mostly just want to prove that King Arthur is who he says he is. Right. So there's a couple of kind of problems with this person pulling out the sword. For one thing, no one sees him do it the first time. So, I mean, he's got the sword, so obviously he pulled it out, or no one else could, but well, they still want him to prove that he can do it. Then there's the problem of um, Merlin, right? So you're talking about the archbishop and the nobles being the powerful, you know, the people with all the money and, and all that. Um, but, um, but Merlin, too, Right. He's kind of a, well, he's not a, a leader in the same way that these nobles are. Um, yeah, so there's, there's that too. They don't fully trust him. They want King Arthur, again, to prove who he is. This isn't just a trick of Merlin's. Um, and then the last thing I guess I'd say about that is um, that Arthur doesn't really want to be king. He, he's kind of forced into it. Um, so it, it doesn't really feel quite like the way that these um, Redditors are going up against Wall Street, right? Because they really want to beat Wall Street at their own game. Um, Arthur really does it kind of on accident. Um, it's just because of who he is. That's his role. He has to take on the role of king. Uh, he's really not ready for it. But he's got the sword, so I guess that's him, right? Um, this whole thing about yeah, um, Arthur, his upbringing, what Merlin's up to there, this is some of the stuff we'll, we'll get into more um, next time, and the way that power works in these stories, uh, I think is pretty interesting. Uh, so yes, great to bring that up. Uh, and if you're going to get some stock in and go up against Wall Street, um, just be careful is all I would say about that. I don't, I don't know enough about it to really comment, but, uh, but use your best judgment, I suppose. Um, the only other topic I had for today, before I let you all go, um, just that there are really great illustrations out there, just not in Rosemary Sutcliffe's version of this story, unfortunately. Um, so one really great illustrator is uh, Arthur Rackham. This is an illustration by Arthur Rackham, and what he's got here I don't know if you can see it very well. This is supposed to be the questing beast. I guess my internet isn't behaving very well. Um, but anyway, the questing beast. Uh, again, um, what these knights are all doing early on is sort of fighting to create the kingdom and get it settled, uh, get it peaceful. But then once that's, once that's accomplished, then you notice that they're going out on these adventures. And sometimes it's to beat up the bad guys, save the damsels, and all that good stuff. But sometimes it's for stranger things, too. Um, to go after a beast with the head of a serpent and the body of a leopard and uh, the legs of a giraffe, whatever. Right? Um, this beast that sounds like the uh, the crying and baying of a hunting pack of hounds. So there's something very strange going on. Um, this thing exists just to be chased indefinitely. Um, and this is one of those things that T.H. White does a really nice job of sort of poking fun at while also making it something the reader is aware of. Like how weird that is, how funny that is. And yet there is something about that, right? This thing that you're just chasing for the fun of it because it's there. Um, because you have to, you can't give up. Um, so this is uh, King Pelinor famously is, is going after the questing beast. Um, he's one of the mighty warriors who uh, joins King Arthur after they fight and he beats him up. Uh, but uh, I just, I like the questing beast as a kind of symbol. So something to think about again is, what are they really up to when they're going on these adventures? 
is it to save people and to be good and chivalrous, right? Whatever that means. Um, or is it about this kind of energy that they have? That they have to use it or else it will be, you know, be either lost, be wasted, or it will be spent just fighting amongst themselves. Right? They have to turn it outwards onto these adventures. What are they up to when they are going after the questing beast, so to speak? Um, so that's that's the last topic I guess I would recommend as you're reading the Sword in the Circle. Keep an eye out for the motivation, the, the meaning or the symbols that you can see in some of the adventures that these, these knights are having. All right. So thank you. Uh, to the, the audience that was here live. Um, if there's any other questions and things, find our webpage, uh, signumuniversity.org slash academy. You'll see that it is updated now. And you'll note that we've got uh, a cool program called Learn Everywhere, that if you're a student in New Hampshire who needs some, call, uh, some high school credit, sorry, uh, credit towards graduation for high schoolers in New Hampshire. Learn Everywhere program is for you. Um, and maybe if you're other places too, um, eventually, maybe, we'll see, uh, you can get credit too if we keep working at that. Um, we've got four different clubs that are starting up pretty soon. Um, books, writing, translation, conversation. And down at the bottom here is the Twitch uh, schedule. Very loosely, we're looking at Rosemary Sutcliffe for the next few months. Um, so you can see more exactly what we're up to going forward from there. You can always uh, get in touch with us here, connect on all these different social medias, and whatnot. Um, send us messages, send suggestions and questions in. And, um, We'll see you all next time. Uh, Till then, again, you can find this book on archive.org or through your library, maybe. Uh, there's definitely copies out there uh, wherever you get your reading material. Um, so do your best to read it uh, before next time, because we'll be doing a little bit more spoilers and things uh, from The Sword in the Circle. By Rosemary Sutton. Thanks again. Take care. See you next time.